I want to look at the error that the forward Euler method makes at each step. This is called the local truncation error. A pretty complex term, but a straightforward thing to be looking at. Again, I'm considering the differential equations of classical mechanics. For simplicity, just in one dimension. The derivative of the position with respect to time is velocity. And the derivative of the velocity with respect to time is the force depending on position. I'm not looking at forces depending on velocities or directly depending on time. You can easily incorporate that over mass. This comes from Newton saying that force equals mass times acceleration. And acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. If we solve this numerically in a naive fashion, this is precisely what the forward Euler method would do. We're doing one forward Euler step to advance the time by a slight increment, by a step size. I want to compute the position after that step. Let's call that x2. From the position before that step, let's call that x1. Of course, these are not equal. There is some slight increment and that's the step size, h times the velocity at the start. This is what Euler says, what we should be doing. We take the original, the initial position, and advance that position by the time that's passing during the step times the velocity at the beginning of the step. Similarly for the velocity, the velocity after that step is the velocity before that step, plus the step size times the rate of change of the velocity, which is the force over the mass. f of x1, again we're taking the force at the start of that step. So this is what we would be computing. This is what we should be doing in terms of mathematics, solving a differential equation. But what we're actually computing with the forward Euler method is tons of steps of this sort, advancing the position, advancing the velocity. The error that we're making here is called the local truncation error. The error of one single step is called the LTE, or the local truncation error. And, well, the question, how large or how small is that error? I want to have an idea about the error that I'm introducing. Do I have to use a way smaller step size? Can I get away with larger step sizes? How does that depend on the mass, on the force, on my current velocity? Whatever. And you can figure that out. I should be saying that because I'm lazy, I'm working in one dimension. There is a slight change to be taken care of when we're working in more than one dimension. I'll mention that as I go. Let's say this red curve is the exact solution of my differential equation. The function that I want to approximate using numerics, using the forward Euler method. I do know the position at the start of my step. Time t1, and this would be x1. I want to know what the position is at the end of that step. Time t2. So this is what I would like to know. This is not x2. x2 is our numerical approximation. This would be x of time t2, the exact solution at time t2. The difference of t2 and t1 is our step size, h. And now we can try and come up with some approximations for this dotted line here. The value of x at time t2. First of all, bottom part here would simply be x1, the value that we've started with. And then I can make use of the slope of that red curve. If I add the tangent, so let's say this blue line is the tangent to the red exact curve at time t1, then my next best approximation for this value would be x1 plus this blue length here. And we get that from the derivative. We know the slope of the tangent. The slope of the tangent is the derivative of x. We know this leg of this right triangle, that's h. 
So this side has a length of the derivative at t1 times h. And we can do even better. Instead of using a line, we can use a parabola. Then the next addition to our approximation would be the second derivative of our function at t1 times h squared over 2. This may look really crazy. Why should that be h squared over 2? If you look at these, you would be saying the next logical thing to be doing would be x second derivative times h squared. Why should we be including that too? The idea is the following. I want to construct a parabola that has the same value, the same slope, and the same second derivative as the original red curve has at t1. This component ensures that I have the right value. Set h equal to 0, I got the right value for that parabola. This component ensures that I have the right slope from the first derivative with respect to h. Set h equal to 0, it's got the right slope. And this term ensures that I've got the right curvature, so to speak. If you form the second derivative of that term, you have to have the second derivative of that red curve at t1. If you form the second derivative, h squared first becomes 2h and then becomes 2, and those two twos cancels. So this 2 stems from forming the second derivative of h squared with respect to h. This construction is called Taylor expansion. And what it leads to is the following. The exact value of x at t2 after the step is x1 plus what we get from the first derivative, x dot of t1 times the step size, plus what we get from the second derivative, second derivative of x with respect to time at the start of the step times h squared over 2, plus, and it's easy to imagine, if you continue that, you get something with h to the third power and so on. We'll sweep that under the rug and say order of h to the third power. If you want to look that up, this is called Landau Big O symbol. So now we've got a nice expression for the position after the step, but there are some things in here that we don't know yet. Actually, we do know them. The first derivative of x with respect to time at the start is, of course, nothing but the velocity we're starting with. The second derivative of x with respect to time at the start is the first derivative of the velocity. And the first derivative of the velocity is the force at that point over m. The force at that initial point x of t1 over m. So that looks pretty handy. This is something we can compute. We do not know much about that order of h to the third power term here, but all of these can be computed. The initial position, the initial velocity, time step size, the force at the initial position over the mass times step size squared over 2. All of these can be computed. We can do the same type of Taylor expansion for the velocity. It's pretty easy to see how that should look like. The exact value of the velocity should be the value before the step, plus, now of course it's the derivative of the velocity at the start, times the step size, plus the second derivative of the velocity at the start times step size squared over 2, plus again something of the order of h to the third power. The derivative of the velocity with respect to time, that's the acceleration, we do know that, force over mass. So this is the force at the initial position over the mass. This one here is a little tricky. The second derivative of the velocity with respect to time. Let's look into this one more closely. The second derivative of velocity with respect to time. Let me write it like that. The first derivative of the velocity, and then I form the derivative of that derivative. I do know something about the first derivative. That's the acceleration. And I know what the acceleration is. It's the force depending on the position over the mass. And now I have a function 
the force that depends on another function, the position that depends on time. This cries out loud for the chain rule. First I found the outer derivative, force over mass, so the derivative of force over mass, times the inner derivative, x dot, the derivative of x with respect to t. And we do know what x dot is, it's simply the velocity. If we're working in more than one dimension, this gets tricky. There's not just a spatial coordinate x, there's also a y and possibly a z. So you have to form several derivatives here of the force vector. This ends up being a matrix, and this would be the product of a matrix times a vector. And another caveat, if the force depends on time directly, not just through the position, but if there's some oscillating part, for instance, in the force, you would have to have another component in here. But in our situation, that's all we've got, which means that this term, our question mark term, equals the spatial derivative of the force at the initial position over the mass times the initial velocity. So also this can be computed from the data that we've got in our simulation. Now we can look at those two equations and try to decipher what their meaning is. x1 plus v1 times h. This is one forward Euler step for x. v1 plus the force at the start divided by m. This is the forward Euler step. So what we've got here is the forward Euler method. What we've got here on the left-hand side is the exact result. So this remainder here must be the error. This is the local truncation error of the forward Euler method. So you can put numbers to that. Given the force, given the mass, and given the spatial derivative of the force, the initial velocity, and so on, you can get a pretty good estimate of the local truncation error of the forward Euler method. And you see that this is of the order h squared. And if you look closely, you see a way to improve the forward Euler method. Let's use what we know from the forward Euler method, but include this one, the force at the initial position over mass times h squared over 2, and similar here with that pretty complicated term in the end. Then we've got a method that has a local truncation error of order h to the third power. This is called the Taylor Series 2 method, TS of 2. Of course, this improvement doesn't come for free. You have to compute the spatial derivative of the force.